or um, so Bai and I talked about what we might do before this was going going to go online and we spoke about a few different ways we might do this event and it became really clear that we didn't want to plan it because to talk about hope and not having hope and to talk about the times we're in from a place of plannedness from it's called be a good host Welcome the fear, the loneliness, the judgments, the boredom. Welcome the growling, the grieving and the fear of missing out. Welcome the hope, welcome the lack of hope, welcome the monsters. Slowly, let them find the seat that they like. It might be your favorite chair, your lap or that space behind the fridge. Welcome them. They may smell of lavender or sewage, of sweet new sunrises or the entrails of lost species. They may, having been welcomed into your home like this, become very, very quiet all of a sudden. And some, perhaps one or two, may begin to scream. Be a good host. Bear with them, make tea, pour out the last of your elderberry vodka and yes, those biscuits that you've been saving for the apocalypse, them too, be a good host. Because now the thing is you're in this together. Laws are being passed to stop you escaping. Be a good host. Welcome those ones you so unwittingly silenced. The monsters are longing for you. They want you to notice, to listen to their stories, play with their tales, to let them wrap you in the greatest of hugs. They want you to tend to their matted hair as if you had all the time in the world. Because maybe you do. Be a good host. Let your welcome be timeless, where no guest ever feels you wanting them to leave, no matter how out of your depth you feel. Be that guest house Rumi spoke of. Let the ones you've been holding at bay be your teachers, your lovers, your savers, saviors, the bearers of new recipes, the writers of new love poems and radical manifestos. Be a good host. Welcome the monsters. Be a good host. Welcome the monsters. I live in India with my family of six and two, and our baby girl and baby boy, and my dear wife. And we, uh, recent events have made, um, made it really difficult to meet the everyday with the uh, spirit of positivity, with the uh, easygoing, um devil may care things are going to be all right kind of spirit that we're usually encouraged to nurture and cultivate and so i'm i i speak today with uh a sense of scatteredness um i hope you would accept me that way i hope you would uh welcome me into your midst um that way i speak with a sense of uh brokenness um I don't need to give all the details except to say that hope seems to be spread very thin um, at this moment. Um, and thankfully, that is the uh, subject of our conversation and our exploration when hope is spread thin, um, as it feels right now. And it seems holding on to hope is just a, fail, a failing expedition, just a breaking enterprise. Like we're holding on tenuously and the system continuously encourages us to keep the hope alive, keep the faith alive. Um, is it Winston Churchill that said, never, 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 never give up? <laughs> I think it was to never ever give up. We will prevail, we will come out on the other side. 
And I wonder if that isn't part of the problem. Never giving up. I wonder if endless hope isn't part of what the system wants us to do. And if that isn't maybe um, maybe something that needs to die. Let me put it this way. The world is alive in stunningly beautiful ways, creative, magical ways that um, our systems of learning, our educational paradigms do not know how to approach. When a star burns, it burns with hope. It's, it's part of its feel, is hope. When it splutters and dies and spits its guts into space, that's hopelessness. And yet that hopelessness is generative. It is the generativity that makes our bodies, that spits the matter that makes us alive, that makes us human. What I'd like to invite, and this is part of my welcome, as we talk about hope and hopelessness, is to invite us to notice hope as the engine of modern progress. Um, and that sometimes there is a lot of abundance in the fields that we've rudely called hopelessness. There's a lot of inquiry. There's a lot of dying. There's a lot of beauty. There's a lot of emergence. There's a lot of intelligence and interspecies symposia waiting to happen. Um, so I welcome you to this crazy, scattered, broken, beautiful, sun-spilling conversation about hope um, and hopelessness and what feels invited when darkness is all that there is, when Dante Alighieri's uh, hellish label hangs true for every land Abandon all hope, all ye and uh, who enter here. I welcome you. I thank you for joining us in this conversation. <clears throat> and realizing some of the ways that I think even hope has been colonized. And I guess you, you were speaking to that a little bit at the beginning, Bio. Mm. I was thinking, what, what is the shape of hope? And if it feels like the way that most of us are taught to shape our hopes are, are about aspiration, about aspirations to be a particular way, to have particular things, to, to, to climb ladders of possession, of money, of status, and that hope, hope's been kind of boxed in to this, this idea of linear progression, of, mm -hmm. of acquisition, of aspiration, mm. of identity, and it's yet another way that we have been taught to make ourselves the center of things. I've been taught, I was taught to make myself the center of everything. Um, I want to pause actually for a moment and, and acknowledge that when I'm saying we here, I'm talking about people brought up with Western education, people brought up and living within the industrial growth system, living within modernism. So just to, to be explicit that it's not we, every human, and it's not we, every being, but those of us who might turn up to a call like this and have the conversations that we're having, mm. that, that hope itself, if we want to know what it is, has, has already been boxed in, has already been made linear, made, mm. made acquisitory about having mm. stuff. And when that kind of hope is gone, when that crumbles, I'm really interested in a, the, what kind of hope starts to come, what other shapes of hope come. And mm. at the moment, it feels like they're often much smaller, much smaller shapes. Kind of, you, you kind of need to lean in a bit, smell them, feel them, more immediate. like little seedlings or dust. I'm just curious how it is where you are now by what kind of shapes of hope 
coming through, being locked in. Well, um, when you look out on the uh, on the landscape, if when you look at what's happening in on television, and you see police officers. Uh, manhandling people or migrant workers stuck in a place um, and being uh, washed en masse, you know, with these giant hoses, like there are cows or something, by the Indian bureaucratic system, by officers of the law wearing masks and then stamped on your wrists, your heart sinks. Um, or recent events, and I can only speak about where I'm, I'm at, um, where our Muslim brothers and sisters chased out of your homes, haunted. Um, it seems there's a lot to, there's, there's, a, there's ample room for despair. And there's, there isn't a lot of space for hope. And yet there is the, there is this cranking up, this mechanism that says, no, 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 we just cannot afford to, to lose hope, which leads me to the question, and I hope this is what we're exploring today. What I wanted to offer is some contribution about the materials of hope. I love what you said, Tony, about how this human-centeredness and this time linearity is already part of the materials of hope. When you ask the question, what is hope? I don't know that it's something stable. Like the kind of hope that a plant exercises as it bursts through the loamy soil is probably of a different texture than the one we um, were told to exercise when we leave work or leave home for work and wake up from our bed like this and drive to work like this and be on the computer like this and go home the same way. Hope seems to me this sterilization of posture. It's like an, it's like a, it's like an, it's like a bodily orientation in the world. It's also a gift, right? It's also how our parents, our institutions, um, the food we're eating, the gut bacteria that is processing the food. It's like this web of life is gifting our bodies this learning, this intuition, this way of being in the world, that if you want to thrive and survive, um, let your body be straight. Let your body be linear. Um, avoid, avoid the invitations on the banks um, or to your sides and focus on the straight and narrow and keep going forward, keep pressing forward towards progress. And hope is beautiful, you know, when, uh, especially when it, it does the work we want it to do. The trick is noticing that that comes with costs, right? It's costly, hope is costly. And what are the costs of hope? The things that are left by the wayside, the generativity of failure, um, the other orientations. Tony, you work with body, right? You, you're very embodied in your philosophies and, and you know how the body is already entangled with what we say and think and yearn and want. And you know this, you know, but even without having the word for it, sometimes you just know what to do when you're with people in a room. Um, um, that invitation to move to the side, to dance, feels to me like a shifting of our, of our centrality. And, and that's the call, what I hear as the call of hopelessness, that maybe the way to go isn't forward, like I've said over and over again, maybe it's awkward. Maybe there are ways of moving to the side that invites uh, a shifting of our positions. What do you think? <clears throat> and the thing that I know Every single time, the thing that I know is that when the body, soul, mind, everything kind of loses hope, when my 
being has lost hope and kind of come right to those edges of, of danger. Those are the moments when something cracks open. Those are the moments where in the breaking, in the breaking of heart, breaking of soul, that there's, there's something else starts to take shape. Something else starts to, to let itself be known. And anything that has had any meaning or significance in my own journey and in watching other people whose journeys I value, it's come from that place where hope was trashed either quickly or kind of little by little drip feed of losing hope. Um, so I see it as it's, it's w without wanting to deny how fucking painful it is, I see it as one of the most fecund places possible mm. when mm. we lose hope. Mm. If, if we're safe enough, if we have just enough of the right kind of resources and the right kind of magic to surrender to it mm. and that surrender itself sometimes takes us by the tail and we've got no choice and sometimes we can learn to have a bit more choice in it but the surrendering to no hope is is the way called panning for gold Wake me now, please take me now. Grab, pull, wrench me free from this place between worlds, please take my hand. Grab the scruff of my soul, bring my breath to the door and fling it wide open for I've been taken again. Lost, locked up, neither weeping nor acting, neither raging nor dancing. Lost. A grey mountain crowds this terrain, and no matter how many maps I make, I can never find the straight road home that I long for. No matter how many maps I make, I can never find the straight road home that I long for. It's crazy making, trying to navigate the workings of the soul in times like these. Lost and locked up, there is no hand on my neck. No grabbing or pulling me to freedom. but a quiet voice whispers, trust the madness, there's gold in them there hills. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Sh share that poem with me, Tony. Beautiful. Mm. Um, I, I love the idea, I'm always attracted to the idea of lostness, right? And, and um, I think, I think we are in probably equal doses lost and found. Um, mm -hmm. the, the problems come in when we uh, pathologize one or create a binarization, a binary, and put one as the supreme, um, a supreme over the other. And I think that is what our modern contexts have done. Um, that is to um, to to make one the enemy, to make one the villain, to make one evil, and to make the other good. You know, right? This is the good side. So hope. Don't be hopeless. Don't fail. Succeed. Um, I'm reminded of uh, I'm reminded of this story. Maybe I'll tell that later. It would be good for telling later um, when I'm speaking at length. Um, but but I want to I I always want to feel like I'm stitched by hope and hopelessness, right? Uh, none to uh, to the exclusion of none. That um, and everyone can feel their own bodies right now. If you want to think about how your um, your parents brought you into being, your mother giving birth to you, and pushing you out into the world, you're not entirely composed of hope if hope were the single algorithms of her DNA. <laughs> you are not just a, you're not just a formulaic product of your mother. You're also um, made of stowaway bacteria. 
you know, bacteria hanging at the matrix, waiting to jump on you immediately you come out into the world. Yeah. Scientists tell us our cells are made up of alien cells as well, and viruses as well. And I like that. I love the idea that I'm not complete, um, that I'm partial, that to hope absolutely is to deny a part of my being, is to cut out something of me, is to deny my ancestry. I think Stephen Jenkins uh, puts it well when he says, the enemy of my ancestor is also my ancestor. When we deny that we are dispersed, that we come from places of failure, um, that we are gifts of shadows as well as of light, as you know, quantum physics will tell us, light is never alone. It already contains shadows and darkness. When we can see that, maybe the invitation right now would be, what does hopelessness, this, what I would think of as, as a movement to the right and to the left, as not just growing up, but growing wide, what would that invite us to uh, do? What kinds of learnings and educational pilgrimages and invitations are alive where or when we've lost our way, when forward movement is no longer possible? What do we do when we've reached the end of the road, right? Um, that's, that's a very pressing question for me right now, sitting here in Chennai, India, my adopted home. It's that um, for many people around us, it's impossible to see the way forward, but maybe there are technologies of hopelessness, maybe there are ways of sharing, maybe there are rites of passages, um, rites of passage um, that might invite us to die well and to die wisely, to see dying wisely, um, not, as, not as a um, philosophy of absolute disappearance as modernity would like us, us to think death is. And I will continue to say that death needs a new cosmology. Hopelessness needs a new cosmology. Um, maybe these rites of passage we can speak about, Tony, um, and, and the invitations that we can conjure and invoke and put words to and poetry to are the, are the next edges for us all as a network of human human beings and yet to be human beings. It feels like it's time to practice that. That it's the time to practice uh, for those of us who are safe enough to be on a Zoom call, safe enough to be having a conversation rather than finding food or finding shelter or protecting our lives, to practice that, to practice what it is. And in any good rite of passage, there is a process of severance, a process of letting mm. go. Mm. And what is it that we could let go of now? And it's something I, I regularly look at, what are the, whether it's about our own identity, it's about the amount of money we need, the amount of space we need, looking good physically, in status, any of these things. What are the things that we can let go of as, as tiny little practices, projects, longings? And I think in order to be able to let go of some of these things, we kind of need to know what our longings are. I was, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that modernity has done is taken us away from our knowing our belonging as part of the world. And what it's also done is in the focus so clearly on achievement, on hoping for and, and aiming to get whatever it is that we want and we're taught that we want, the, the sweetness of longing for something kind of got lost along the way. And, and longing and yearning as an entity in itself, as part of that cosmology of hope and hopelessness. I think one of, uh, uh, one of the biggest planets in that cosmology is longing, but it's kind of got shoved under the carpet somewhere or, or occluded by 
achievement and getting. So I think there's something in the rite of passage in the cosmology of hope that, that it's about letting go and it's also about letting longing be here. What is it that we really long for even if we know we're never going to get it and as things get worse and worse you know even pre-covid with climate change and ecological oh god my language i just want to swear a lot about this stuff the destruction of ecosystems of whole ecosystems of of individual beings within ecosystems the depletion of soils the ongoing oppression and colonization of people in our own species of of all of this even before covid came along and changed the world again because we're losing so much already and we are going to keep losing stuff and i'm surprised at myself at using this language but it is our duty and when i say our duty i mean those of us who are well enough to be on a zoom call and have these conversations there is something, I wouldn't usually use that language, but there's a fierce duty of belonging that is to keep letting go of more. To keep letting go of the things that we thought we were promised. To keep letting go of our aspirations. To keep letting go of hope. And, and it feels like one of the keys to that is to become more intimate with, the, with our longings and, and kind of decouple them from each other. The longing from the getting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can play with that you know, I hear that as removing the band aid, right? Um, mm -hmm. Letting the wound. Um, um, the, I'm I'm not exactly too fond of the notion of wounds healing, as you know. I I think there's a form of healing that is about opening wounds, so that they open us up to other forms of being. And that's only possible when you see wounds as portals. Um, being, a, being a psychologist, I've, or a recovering one, I like to say, um, I've, I've sat, you know, I've had this ringside um, tickets. I've had my ringside tickets to the arena of suffering. Um, and I was trained to put people together, you know put people back together again. And part of my arsenal of tricks was to, uh, the philosophy of it, not the methodology, not to speak of Freudian psychoanalysis or CBT or, or all of that, but the, but the philosophy of it, the, the idea of it, the spirit of it was, was um, to deny, as you so beautifully say, Tony, to deny those the yearnings of our bodies to see endings as bad things, you know, um, to see them as external to ourselves, just like where we imagine death to be this down the road ending that we will all suffer. Um, modernity says it's down the road. Um, so life is about longevity. But a different relational perspective will say, you're already ending right now as we speak. Your cells are dying in their millions. Uh, death is not far away. Death is intimately close. You're dying and living. What if you saw death as sighing and gasping and breathing? What if death is the eloquence of loss? And what if loss is the engine of emergence? And what if all these together are wrapped up in each other? Um, so my people, People know how to grieve well. And I, and I never really experienced or understood these things because as I, as I continue to say, I was very well educated. And to be educated is to be dissociated from one's own yearnings, my bodily yearnings, my bodily gifts, the true soul of gifts that I've received from my ancestors, pushed to the side um, to make space for eternal hope. Um, I remember taking my father to the village. My father died when, was when I was 15. And I remember us going with him. He's quite an important man. And so the villagers came out and they were screaming on the vehicle, Tony, just 
hitting the vehicle where his body was in a casket and screaming. And I remember myself and my sisters getting annoyed and pissed that these guys didn't know that, you know, this is all phony stuff. Why are they uh, crying? You know, they didn't know that. That didn't, wasn't fond of the village. We're city people. Um, and um, by the graveside, speaking to dad and people literally tearing out their hair and rolling on the ground um, and, and crying and crying even more than we were. It was almost distracting and <laughs> infuriating. Why are you guys taking our place? This is supposed to be our moment of... Uh, Thankfully, um, the universe didn't leave me in my ignorance. I was gradually invited to see grief as a public event, not a private event. That grieving is, it's not even a human quality. It's, uh, it's the texture of everything. It's how leaves fall from trees. It's how petals open in the morning. It's, it's the aliveness and intelligence of the world. And when Africans, and especially Yoruba people, roll on the ground and breathe, they are ceremonializing, they're ritualizing, dying. They're dying wisely. They're dying well. They're not keeping hope alive. They're, they're materializing hopelessness. And because we don't have spaces like this in our modern settlements, um, we chase, I like the... <laughs> the American constitution declaring that the pursuit of happiness is a principle. You know, I wish it also made space for the pursuit of grief. You know, it's just the pursuit of happiness. And so there's no, in America being this emblematic incident, you know, incidents of the absolute persistence of hope and joy. But when you push out the entanglement of grief and gratitude and all of that and hopelessness and, with hope, when you, once you demonize one side of it, you end up with a fetishized aspect of the other. You, you end up with fetishized joy, materializing as absolute consumerism, extractivism, white colonialism. You end up with dispossession and, and suffering and pain. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't even know where I'm going with that. Just, <laughs> just when you were speaking, the the, the, the thought of rolling on the ground and of a friend of mine telling me a story about a woman who was always crying and then he was always wondering why she was crying. Then he approaches her one day and says, why are you always crying? Oh, no, 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 it's the other way. She is always smiling, always happy. And then he approaches her, why are you always smiling? And she says, um, it's because I know how to cry well. You know, that wisdom that knows that um, once I give space for grief, I sense the tech, I can taste the textures of joy. Once I move to the side, I'm moving into other worlds, other spaces of power. Hopelessness is fugitive. And, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that this time of the coronavirus and climate change and all of that is, is an opening to those spaces of power. And I don't know what it is to say about this. So this is one of the places, one of the places where I can get lost into hopelessness is mm. in the place between the kind of conversation we're having and the, mm. the power of poetry. Mm. And the question, uh, a question came to me on the weekend from, from your invitation, which in a way speaks to my dilemma and the, one of the places that I can lose hope quite quickly and just plummet. Mm. And it's, it's something around does, uh, does poetry matter to those it doesn't touch? And so as we're sitting here having this conversation, as we're sitting here having, you know, sharing poems, sharing, explorations one of the people that I have kind of on my shoulder is um, I don't know their name 
they're a nameless person, but they're somebody who is in um, Brookhouse Detention Centre near Gatwick. So they're someone who has tried to escape a very difficult life and turned up here and been put into detention. Um, and so they're one of the many people I kind of feel like I have at my shoulder as we have this conversation in the same way that you have spoken of the people in India, where you are, who are being beaten for going outside and who are being... <laughs> the description that you gave of them being disinfected like animals, let alone the animals that we treat in that way. Mm. And what I want to make sure doesn't happen on this call is that we don't bypass these places of grief. But I want to keep bringing it home to what's it like to sit each of us, all 79 of us, goodness. I just looked at the number of participants. So 79 of us, what's it like to sit here in our spaces and know that these things are happening? to know, and I'd like to actually not bring my voice, I'd like to bring um, a few lines from this uh, unnamed person. So this is from a website called detainedvoices.com. I can put it in the chat. <clears throat> and it's people who are in detention centers um, and they have a phone number they can call and they can say whatever they want to say and it's written down verbatim and it goes onto this website. So I wanna bring at least one voice of the many people who are nowhere near being able to have this conversation with us. Uh, there is no social distancing here. I've been in Brookhouse Detention Center for 16 months. I came from prison. I thought I was gonna be released, but they brought me here to Brookhouse. After six months, I started getting bored and stressing about my life day by day. Three months ago, I started tripping it had been a year, my hands were sweating, I couldn't sleep, and I felt hot. There was something I hadn't felt before. I couldn't get the thoughts of getting me out of this place, out of my head. They gave me paracetamol. I'm, I'm skipping parts because it's very long. They gave me paracetamol and some medicine called calms, and since that day, I'm not the same person. Small things get to me. My short-term memory is shot. Old term memory is cloudy. The interviewer asks how have things changed since coronavirus. Two weeks ago, they put, they put two people in isolation. I heard from a good officer that I've known for a long time. He told me they're in there and they're suffering and they're not getting tested. Another guy who serves us food suddenly got taken away. They grabbed him. They were wearing white clothes and a mask on their face and blue gloves when they moved them out. He could have already spread it everywhere and this made everyone scared. They're not doing tests. We don't know if there is a virus or not. The officers who are working in isolation are wearing full body suits. Some officers on the wings are wearing face masks and gloves. I feel like I have symptoms, but I do all the time. I'm not gonna tell them because if I do, they will take you back to the block to solitary confinement. They won't test you and they will leave you there. They don't want these officers to find out that there is a virus outbreak. A lot of people feel ill in here. They are coughing and they are scared. Six days ago, they closed down the church, the mosques and other religious rooms where people congregate. There are less officers at the center. Having less officers means less wings open, which means you have to wait in order to leave the wing. There was a protest. I feel like I'm on remand. They've forgotten about us. It's like we don't exist. So I don't know what it's like to be in that kind of place of no hope. And that's why I wanted to bring that one voice And it feels like it could be, Bayo, you might have something you want to add. Um, but I'd also like to invite 
people into pairs and just to speak a little bit to each other about what it's like to have no hope. While including having heard this one unidentifiable person's voice. Mm. I've been speaking with a woman um, who is quickly becoming a friend of mine. And um, I, I, I think I posted something on Facebook a while ago and, and she wrote a, a note as a comment, basically saying, this is, uh, you know, it's, I'm in a very terrible place and, and I'm, it's, things are not working out for me. It, it almost sound, it was desperate. The most desperate comment I've ever received on anything I've shared on social media. And I reached out to her and then we started talking um, just a few days ago, we started talking. And she, she, she told me a story that I, I do not believe I'm in any place to share. I do not have her permission. But I remember telling my wife that it was one of the most, um, it, was, it was a shocking story of, of tragedy and loss. And I did not know how to sit with it. And I felt my, I felt my words and philosophy was only getting in the way of being in that moment, right? And as she spoke, I just cried. It was, it was just a Zoom call of tears. And there was nothing else to be done. Nothing else I could say. I was smitten with, with uh, such a heavy burden of sorrow. And um, at the end of it, we promised each other to speak again. Why? <laughs> Why do we have to come again to speak with all of this despair? Um, because in that moment of sharing, um, we kind of knew, and I think we acknowledge this and put it into words, into language. We kind of recognized that as we shared this story of loss and as we sat, as we stayed in the trouble of that that there was something liberatory about that. There was, there was, it, it wasn't a resolution. There was no solution, obviously. Um, I don't have a million dollars to send to her. Um, um, and I remember thinking, I wish I had lots of money to, to spare. But in just sitting with the trouble and just having almost 10 minutes of silence, just sitting on Zoom, the kinds of things that Zoom is making possible these days. Um, we felt that there was an opening. It was like a libation. It was like a release, if you will. And I'm going to be doing this with her speaking and just listening together with her in the days to come. Um, and I don't know what wants to happen, but I feel that the burden, let me use your words, Tony, the duty of hopelessness is to stay in the trouble of it, is to stay there because it is there that we are worked upon. Um, my dear brother, I'm very happy to see that he's here, Duncan Passmore, uh, just uh, shared something about a quote from Martin Preckdock, individualists cannot afford to grieve. And, and I think that's true, you know, and this, weaves back into what you're inviting, Tony, that the, the transaction of modernity is to exchange for centrality, a sense of entanglement. And so we cannot afford to grieve because grief, of grief is the opposite of joy. And that is the, that is the hard uh, bargain that is struck when we, um, when we are gestating citizens in cities and modern projects. Tony, you said something about despair. 
um, that you don't want to fall into a place of despair. I like to think of despair as the opposite, yeah. right? What do you say? No, I think despair is an important place. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, despair can be, uh, can be baffling and immobilizing. Um, I, I think it's what, I think it's the, uh, the opposite, you know, the other side, at least from a modern perspective, the other side of hope. Like, it's either you're moving or you're stuck in one place. And I really want to counterbalance, you know, throw against that binary, the idea of hopelessness. And not hopelessness divorced from hope, but hopelessness as, as, as a maternal place, as a fecund place, as a generous place, as, a, as an abundant place. Um, it's not the opposite of hope. It's not the otherized version of hope. It is uh, hope in its materiality. Decolonized hope is always involving hopelessness. When we're at our lowest point, that is when transformation is possible. Uh, there, is a, there is a culture, uh, pollination, that has a rite of passage, a ritual that involves um, curling one's body. It's like, is it called bungee jumping? You know, that dive deep, except there's no safety here. Um, you hurl yourself, there's no net below. And they, uh, they attach this twine around your left or your right foot. And, but you're pushed and you fall after spending three days fasting and clearing out your body, no sexual activity, no food, minimal drink, you hurl yourself. And they say that it is at that place where you're closest to the ground. It's at that place where you're about to bash your brains that you change into a man or a woman. It's at that place, that liminal place where everything is about to go black. That is when you change. I like cultures. I like it when cultures appreciate the indeterminacy of life. Um, the, the gift of trouble. In my culture, it's facial scarification. In the Hausa culture in Upper Nigeria, it's whipping a man as he proposes to a lady, literally whipping him with cords. That's the way you make claim, uh, a claim to manhood in that culture. So I want to speak about, again, the materials of hope. And I took a few notes because, uh, like I said, um, I'm feeling a bit dispersed today. They're good notes, I assure you. So we, can, uh, we can take notes too, if you want to. Um, but let me, tell, let me start with a story. To speak about hopelessness and, and what I feel is is in for us, all of us here, every one of us. What, what feels like, again, I love the word duty, Tony. I don't see it in a Christianized uh, moral imperative sense, a top-down hierarchical formation. I see it as tasting food and just, oh, that is so good. You know, giving in to what your body already knows is true. Um, instead of so it's internal, if you will. It's internal, external, so to speak, not just absolutely external. I feel that the duty of this time is a, a precious, fragile, and yet um, um, powerful call for everyone, as many of us that are in that space, to be midwives for the impossible, to hold spaces open for the otherwise to spill through. And this is hard work. This is difficult work. Um, rites of passages, as I've just described, are not parties. Um, they're not places where we get high. They're not places where we sing kumbaya and we assure each other that everything will be fine. 
it's not a species of positive thinking. It's a place of transformation. So let me start with this story. Um, I travel a lot, and one of the places that I've been to that has been so transformative for me um, is Brazil, um, for obvious reasons. Well, obvious to people who know me and what I talk about. In a town in, in Brazil, in a city, I mean, not a city, a small uh, fishing community um, called Laguna, it's in Santa Catarina, um, there is a strange phenomenon. And the BBC actually captured this some time ago. Um, if you were out riding a bicycle in the morning and you just passed a place where there's some water, you will find fishermen knee deep in the water doing absolutely nothing. No, I mean, not doing anything. They're not throwing their nets. They're not fishing. They're just standing there like it's a Hollywood movie and it's oh, some, something horrific is about to happen. They're standing knee deep in the water doing absolutely nothing with their fishing nets in their hands. If you lingered and waited to see what might happen, um, you might find that the men um, will start to stare a bit. Uh, some, there'll be some movement a bit and it's because a dolphin would come out in the water and they would utter the dolphin's name they would say ah that is Katerina or that is uh, uh, Josephine we know that one and the dolphin would go back into the water and another one might pop out somewhere in the distance and flick her tail and that would be another signal to the men and then they will suddenly move um, to the right or to the left it's like it's like something orchestrated if you were to watch it live yourself. And then suddenly, one of the dolphins will come out, poke its head out, and the men will ready their nets because immediately, a couple of minutes afterwards, fish would start swimming in their direction. And the men will throw their nets and hauling the fish um, without breaking a sweat. The BBC captured this uh, story uh, sometime, and you can check it out. Just type in Laguna um, Dolphin Fisherman on Google. You, you should find a video of this very strange interspecies relationship. Across Laguna, in a, in a different town, there's, a uh, uh, there's another fishing community. They use the highest, um, they use uh, advanced technologies to fish. The irony is that they don't get as much fish as these people who do nothing, but literally listen and talk with dolphins. What that tells me is, and I'm thinking of uh, doing nothing as a form of dying and dying as a form of hopelessness here. I'm thinking about the generativity, the generousness, the, the beauty of doing nothing. And by doing nothing again, I don't mean being passive. I mean, I mean there's a lot of life in that we miss out of when we um, do everything or when we put us on ourselves the burden of doing everything. Um, a couple of years ago in Richmond, my daughter. Um, was uh, two years old, she's six years old now. And I woke up that morning because we're on schooling. We try experiments with her. I woke up that morning thinking to myself, Tony's heard this story before, um, that I'm going to do everything my daughter says that I should do. I'm just, it's, it's an experiment in saying yes. I'm just going to do everything she says I should, I should do. Just just to test the limits of my fatherhood. Um, I've never done it since. It's, I, I don't do it again. It's, it, I did it that once and that was enough. It's, it's done. The experiment is over with. Um, but that day she woke up in the morning and I told her about my intentions. Ali, this is what I'd like us to do. I'm gonna say yes to anything you say. And she immediately, 
just in her toddling wisdoms, just, uh, you know, just jumped on the bandwagon and said, Dada, let's go swim. I can't swim to save my life. Um, but I said yes, because I promised my daughter that I was going to swim. And so there was a swimming pool nearby. This was in Richmond, Virginia, and, uh, in a place where we're staying with family. And so she dragged me to the, to what I thought was supposed to be the pool. And I was taking her to the pool, but she was dragging me in an opposite direction. And I said, Ali, this is the pool right here. You wanted us to swim. I figured I could just wade in the water and pretend like I was swimming. But she said, that's the pool. And she was pointing at the lake, not the pool. She was pointing at the lake. And then I really got scared, wondering if I should call up the experiment. But no, I'm a good father. Am I not? And so I said, okay, let's go swim in the lake. And we started to walk in the lake. And then uh, midway, she stopped me and said, Dada, remove your, sh your slippers. Uh, and I removed my slippers. And then she said, wear mine. And so I squeezed my feet into her slippers. And she wore my giant slippers. And we continued walking. By this time, the American people around us were already getting suspicious. Um, probably the, these guys are, there's something wrong here. Um, we got to the lake, we got to the side of the lake and um, stopped there. I was hoping she wouldn't say we get into the water because there was no re redeeming myself from that. I was going to say no at that point. But she just stopped in her tracks and we stayed there together. And it was getting really awkward. Here I, I am with my two-year-old daughter and we're standing still just like those fishermen in Laguna, doing absolutely nothing. And then um, I felt, let me feel this empty moment with a, some kind of father-daughter situation. Let me tell her the story of my people, of her grandfather, who she's never met any of her grandfathers. Let me tell her, let me make this a Kodak moment, right? Let me make this a beautiful moment that I could keep in my trophy of moments. And so I started to speak to her. I said, Ali, do you know? And she said, shh, Dada, don't say anything. Don't say anything. It was like God telling Moses to remove your slippers. That this is holy ground. And so I decided to keep quiet and shush and do stand there doing nothing. I want to invite everyone after this call to try doing nothing. The nothingness that modernity is so afraid of is replete with species and life forms and manifold wisdoms. Um, space isn't empty at all, is the gist of this story. I stood there with my daughter, um, not knowing what was going to happen next, just staying with the trouble, that awkwardness. And I do not know how to share it with anyone else except to say that I had some kind of an enlightenment moment. I didn't, get a, I didn't get a halo, I didn't start to levitate, nothing of that sort. But in that moment with my daughter, um, I, I kind of saw everything in, in, in powerful colors. I don't know how to say it, never known how to express this, but everything became real. I, I, I noticed, I noticed a, a tree, I say for the first time. I noticed an ant scurrying through the grass as if for the first time. It was like I was, I was cradled by something larger than myself. It was like being out in nature, but it wasn't me in charge. It was like I'd met Yemoja, um, the mother of all children of fish, the Yoruba goddess who is the uh, creatrix, the, the mother of everything. It was like I was in her presence. It was like I was in the presence of a monster, something greater than I was. And uh, it was a moment that, it has been a moment that has lived with me. It's still with me every moment um, between me and my daughter, between me and my family. Of course, the experiment ended there because she started to go um, deep and say that I eat some mud, put some mud on your face, um, roll in the... And, and I just, you know, Ali, you know what, let's call it off. And so he called it off and that was the end of the day. Um, but that moment, that day, I, re I remember how nothing is, the idea that nothing is empty is, 
is deceitful, is a conceit of modernity. And that is the emptiness that has been transposed, transmutated into this notion of grief, of hopelessness, of loss. I speak again of Brazil when I want to notice that one of the most powerful structures and architecture of hopelessness is the favela. I don't know who has been to Brazil here. Um, I, I, I was there recently, like I said, and I visited the first um, favela in Brazil, Providencia, um, which the origin of that is that there was this Brazilian war, I think the Canudos War in the 19th century, and they recruited the, the African slaves and soldiers, you know, to fight this war. And as they were fighting, they promised them, we will give you housing on your return. If you can fight for the state, we will give you housing upon return. And when those men came back, um, they found that there was no house for them. There was no room for them in the new Brazilian order. So their wives decided to take action. And what they did, their wives and their mothers and their daughters, is that they retreated to the mountains. They lost hope in the system. And they retreated to the mountains. Providencia Favela now surrounds Rio as if there were fugitives surrounding a crack or a rupture in the fabric of things. And I walked through that favela, seeing how people were generating stories, seeing how people were cooking and, and living with each other. And I noted that there was more joy in that architecture of hopelessness than I had witnessed in the city. More playfulness in a slum without romanticizing it and saying everything was fine and dandy. There was joy, there was something textured about the way the people called each other and the way we were made welcome into the homes of people. So I, How do we make space for hopelessness then? How do we make space? How do we make space for the gift and abundance around us when hope doesn't serve anymore? When our maps do not lead to any place interesting? When the roads terminate and there's nowhere else to go? Hope is that loud, annoying Siri, Google sound telling us where we are. It's the imperative of location, insisting that this is where you are and this is where to go. But there is a time when we need to turn Siri. Is it Siri? When we need to turn that software off and listen to other voices. So let me go through this and take us through this very brief a cartographical project of mapping out what hope um, or hopelessness might invite us to do. First, hope is a material way of seeing. We like to think of hope as uh, something linguistic, something ideational, something uh, heady. It's a feeling, it's a state, it's an expectation. But I, I, I want to protest that and say that Hope is not just a feeling, it's not just something internal, something in our minds. It exceeds our bodies and our minds. It is, it is a parliament of processes and voices and gestures and actions that exceed us. It is how trees process oxygen. It is how bacteria process food in our guts. It is how the city rationalizes our bodies. It is the biopolitics of nation states. It is how we are arranged in the world. It is an orientation of bodies. Hope is not just how we feel. And even if we say it is just how we feel, how we feel is also entangled with everything we're doing in the world and what the world is doing with us. Secondly, hope is 
an exclusionary framework. It is an orientation that cuts out other ways of being in the world. When my people say the times are urgent, let us slow down, or um, in order to find your way, you must get lost. It's because they have a technology that notices that if you're happy all the time, if you're lively all the time, then you're not alive at all. If you're, um, if you're heading down the straight and narrow, then you're missing out on the terrain that is you. You're missing out on cutting out many other parts of yourself that want to be heard. So hope is exclusionary. It is complementary. Something is lost when you insist on going the straight and narrow. Thirdly, hope is tethered to the dream of modernity. It is the stabilizing force that insists um, that we are central. Uh, Tony, you put it beautifully the other time when you said, uh, um, um, hope has this anthropocentric idea. It's about us, it's about humans, it's about time going forward. It's so, it's all about us. But what about the other things around us? What about the emergent world around us? Fourthly, hope doesn't know how to listen to the gift of loss. Um, I've suffered many losses. Um, you've heard of some. Losing my father, losing my culture, and losing my entanglement with my people is one that I'm still suffering today. I don't know how to speak my own language. I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to meet my ancestors. I'm still on that decolonial journey. And yet, um, I feel if I rush headlong into the highway of progress, I will lose out on all the gifts of staying here in my not knowing. the gift of loss. And then finally, what the gift of loss takes us into is, the, is darkness as inquiry. Darkness as research. What I think I'll share with everyone another time, maybe I'll send a note or something, and I'm hoping we can keep our research alive is, is Portraits of descent uh, or descent. Um, people going under into the ground and learning how to stay with darkness and processing darkness together so that they can find other ways of being in the world. And they had to go under because hope was dead for them on the surface. I remember the stories of the Christians in Rome and how they dug the catacombs because there was no place on the surface to do their religion. And so they had to go under into the caves and paint on the walls and then bury their dead over there. There is a time for going under, and I think this is a time for going under. There's a time for retreating, um, to use a nerdish trope, a Tolkien-esque uh, metaphor, when the elves moved away from um, Middle Earth. There's a time for retreating away from the surface, moving away from the city. There's a time when we have to give up when we literally are invited to give up and to surrender to something greater than ourselves. How does that look like? Um, I think it looks like sanctuary. And this is where I wanna end things. Um, I've been working with this methodology and idea of sanctuary for some time. Um, I've, I've been reading up about it. The old practice of claiming sanctuary um, that emerged in England um, when people who were fugitives chased by the law, were chased into a church. And what they had to do was to grab a piece of the church and then claim sanctuary. The piece of the church they needed to grab was almost always um, the gargoyle. There was this door knocker uh, that was on the face of the church. And you needed to grab that most of the time to claim sanctuary before you were admitted into the, the sanctuary. I've wondered why a monster is the invitation to the hospitality of sanctuary. 
why is it that a monster is the one that greets the fugitive instead of the face of an angel? Why is it the monster that invites the fugitive into sanctuary? I feel that sanctuary only admits those who are broken. And the work of breaking us open is the monster's vocation. That is why today, um, in this time of hopelessness, in this time of what do we do now with COVID-19? What do we do now with climate change? As wounds open on our bodies, the first instinct is to patch it up, is to rush to a manifesto, is to rush into some solutionism, some NGOism. And I'm the recipient of the benevolence from the West. Uh, my people have received so much kindness from the industrialized world that we don't know what to do with it anymore because it's burning in heaps in our dump grounds. Computers that have been transported by um, recycling traditions in the West come and land in our playgrounds um, and we don't know what to do with them. So we're tired of that benevolence and we're paying attention to a different kind of intelligence, the intelligence of wounds, the intelligence of brokenness the cracks that allow us to become something different. What does this look like? Oh, that's an entirely different topic and I don't wanna to take too long. But sanctuary looks like brokenness. It looks like any kind of rite of passage, any artistic framework, any invitation that opens us out to community, that opens us out to the gift of dying, that helps us meet each other, not to bring the minorities into a place of power, but to descend to the place that the minorities are. And by minorities, I don't just mean people of color. I mean objects around us. I mean the non-human. I mean ancestors. I mean the invisible ones that we've forgotten how to notice. The work of hopelessness is not just sitting in despair because nothing, I mean, nothing, sitting in despair is not even doing nothing. It's doing a lot of work. The work of hopelessness is finding out what our wounds are inviting us into. It's chasing the treasure that is already um, lining or lined up in our places of brokenness, the cracks in our skin. So how we're doing it where I am to make it more practical is um, we are sharing, um, we have gift culture traditions. Um, we are opening out a shop of the open heart. It's one way we practice sanctuary here in India and in our neighborhood here. We put out a table and then we bring things of value to us and we put it on the table and then we invite people to pick from it. And then we share with them to decolonize the notion that ownership is right. And then we invite people to pick and share their stories in the process of picking. Another way we're doing that is we're having circles to celebrate our sorrows. We're building altar to sorrows right now in my family. Um, the sorrows with the most, our Muslim brothers and sisters, um, the tragedy of their loss. We put a portrait up and speak their names. And it might sound nonsensical, but in doing that, we're opening ourselves out to other ways of cultivating a witnessing spirit. Not a witnessing spirit, but a with nesting spirit, a way of being alive to the world. A third way we're doing that is we're learning to listen to our children. Um, adultism is materializing in form of, and has materialized in form of schooling traditions. Schooling is a form of colonization. So we're learning to treat our children as elders. We're following our children in doing research. We're treating our children as philosophers. Um, I have a project with my daughter, apart from saying yes to her, which I never do, I, have, I stopped doing. Um, I have a tradition where I go out with her, pick up things on the street and come back and tell stories about those objects. Um, plastic, um, shells, <laughs> wherever we can find shells. Or, or sometimes pieces of shit um, with some protection, of course. We come back and we, we, we enchant the world by bringing in these immigrants um, 
from the non-human and stain with them as if they were colleagues. The idea here is to re-enchant our relationship with the world. That is the whole invitation of hopelessness, to bring us back into relationship with the manifold, not to leave us in a place where it's dark and dreary, and not to rush us back into the light as if darkness doesn't have its own imperatives, but to restore a different kind of relationship, to bring us into a dancing with the world, or waltz with the world at large. Um, those are some of the ways we're creating sanctuary. Those are some of the ways we're materializing hopelessness. Um, and we're still finding out what that means and what, how other people are doing this. What I'd like to invite here as I close, and I, uh, I'd like uh, Tony to, to speak, is, is that we form together a network of sharing our recipes of making sanctuary, of materializing hopelessness. What would, what would Evan do where Evan is um, with your locality? How, how could you listen to the voices of people crying out there or the streams of sorrow and sadness that you're already immersed in? How do you, how do you become a catalyst, not for their resolution, but for their midwifery? into something different, for their transmutation into something different? How do we become midwives for the otherwise? Um, and one way to do this is this technology of sanctuary. Um, how would uh, April do it wherever she is? How would Holly and Joe and Emma, how would we do it wherever we are? Um, it involves us listening to the voices around us, researching into what people are thinking. Tony just brought um, uh, the words of someone feeling the COVID crisis in, a, in an entirely different way. When people talk about social distancing, um, they don't realize most of the time that social distancing is only possible with people who have homes. What about the homeless? When they talk about uh, um, keeping masks on, Many people can't afford that. Many people don't even know how to, um, don't even know where their next meal is coming from. How do we hold spaces for this without resorting to a kind of uh, degenerative kindness that is, or patronizing compassion that just leaves people where they are and exalts us in places of power? How do we come down to their place to, to meet them where they are not to bring them up to where we are, but to meet them where they are, to wash their feet. That's another practice that I didn't tell you about, washing feet. We do that every week here, wash each other's feet to tell us we are not separate. We are together in this mess. But how can we experiment and invent new rituals in this time? So um, this is it, folks. Um, these are interesting times. These are times of hopelessness, but that's not a bad thing after all, is it? Um, because it's only in the realms of hopelessness that we can invent new worlds, that we can invent new possibilities, that we can listen to what the elders want us to hear. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Tony. Thank you, brother. We're in such a particular time with this um, new, this, this new, this baby, it's not a baby, but this, this new virus that, that we don't know how long it's been around. It could have been around since, since the primordial soup, but it's been around in places that weren't asked to touch. And then we started touching those places and we have started to be touched by this new being, this new creature. And so there's a different shape of hopelessness that's arrived, that's being facilitated by what we're calling the coronavirus, COVID-19. So it's facilitating us into new places of hopelessness, new places of possibility. 
And for some, it's a very immediate uh, life and death situation. For some, it's probably not even, so now I'm talking about us, our species, for some of our species, it's not even touching them because poverty and situations are so much more here than the virus itself. And maybe it just hasn't arrived yet as well. Maybe it never will. But I was trying to think about what, how do we, as, as human beings, how do we respond when hopelessness hits? And I was thinking like if, if a tsunami came and a great wave came towards my house and there is no hope left for my house, there is probably no hope left for some of those that I love, human and more than human. There is no hope left for the history of this village in material form. But this wave is here and how I respond is going to be very different from if my home is little by little hit by damp and mold and coldness and it creeps in little by little and the kind of hopelessness that comes from a great wave about to crash at your house is very different from the hopelessness that comes when year after year there is mold, there is damp, there is the rotting of wood and the, the darkening of the walls and there is no hope because there is no money and there is no care and there is no social community, there is no reciprocal rhythm between people that we come and take care of each other so it's a very different pace and shape of hopelessness and so what do we do when there is no hope when there's no wave no mold to see or touch so a poem that I think without realizing speaks to sanctuary. <clears throat> and within the poem, I offer blessings to all of those in peril. And this poet, poem speaks to those of us who are not directly in peril. Settle in. Settle in. At this time of enforced slowing. Have you noticed the rush? At this time of enforced slowing down, have you noticed the rush? To make change, to save the world. At this time of enforced slowing, have you noticed the rush? At this time of great uncertainty, have you noticed the crowding in of knowledge? But what if this really is the hour? What if this really is the turning of tides that we've been waiting for? The moment for those of us who've cared so long, yet have been nested enough, protected enough to never really get it until now. What if this really is the hour? For those of us, thus, for those of us, us who never really get what trouble feels like, and here it is, what it is like to lose what we knew, what the weft of the cloth of the emperor's fading garment is spun from. What if this is the moment? Don't rush. If there ever was a time for it, this is the one, to settle in and meet it all, to settle in and listen, get curious, careful and courageous. For these don't do so well when we are busy trying to make sense of it all. Don't rush. Be humble, be slower, be unsure, be backward, be forward, be grumpy, be sweet, don't be certain. What if we really are the ones we've been waiting for to tend to the turning of tides? Well then let's be them carefully. Let's not repeat the troubles blindly. Don't rush, don't be certain. What if this really is the time we've been waiting for? Don't rush. Don't be certain.
we already know that one of the things that we must do when there is no hope is pause. One of the most important things to do is slow down, pause. Let it be here. So my edited down four point plan for what to do when there is no hope is to get to know hopelessness. Really get to know it as if it were your lover, as if it were your neighbor. Like the monsters that we spoke of right at the beginning. Be a good host. And to know hopelessness, you need to know your avoidances. Where are the places that you don't let yourself come close to the void? Like Matt spoke about the getting busy, getting reactive to other people. And this, this time of COVID and, and seeing how people are responding is a great testing ground, a great, great, it's almost like a, uh, it's almost like the textbook of how humans respond, modern humans respond. to the unknown and to uncertainty. All the ways that people avoid by getting busy, by attacking each other, by spiritually bypassing the fact that this is, this is a wonderful time of, of pause. It is that and it's also really, really shit. People are dying, people are having to take care of each other. People are being neglected, troubles are being neglected because we now have this virus to focus all our attention on. So know your avoidances. Kiss the void so that you can know hopelessness. Number two, no hope. Not as something that will succeed, that will bring you glory or salvation, not as something that will puff you up and make you whole again, but as shapes of longing that deserve witnessing. Know what you long for without any need or expectation for it to be fulfilled. And, and I mean that, like really, if you've never done it before, really, really hang out with what you long for. Let it be spoken out loud and let you yourself feel the fullness of the longing. And any time the voice comes in, yeah, but I can't have that. Well, that's not right to want that. And it's quite good. You can sort of like the, the, the warm up for longings is, is getting to know what you want. outrageous, unreasonable, rude, greedy. Know your longings, know your wants so that you can know hope. Not as something that will succeed, but as one of the many monsters and beloveds that we live with. Number three, speed up Tony. Get angry, really get angry. What do you do when there is no hope? Get angry. Remember those with less and sit with them. We've spoken about grief and how important grief is, but get fucking angry because that's where our life force is as well. When we're angry with our heart open, it's magical. It is magical. And it's yet another piece of the human brilliance that has been suppressed and oppressed is the beauty of heart open anger. Number four, despite everything we've just said, organize anyway. <laughs> organize anyway. Use the privileges that you have to help those who don't have them, not to fix but to fill the heart, to make relatedness visible. Organize digging over the soil that someone's had to leave behind because they're self-isolating. Organize delivering food to your neighbors and, and, and sticking egg boxes of eggs on their walls. Organize anyway. Organize whatever you can do to support those people who are struggling to take care of other people. Organize to bring flowers with hand sanitizer to your bus driver who's stuck in his job even though he's terrified, but he has to keep his job but no one's taking care of the bus drivers or the hospital porters. Organize anyway. When there is no hope, make relatedness visible. 
enact love in action in any way that you can. That's it. There's loads more actually. Oh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be really naughty and add the last one. What do we do when there is no hope is that we remember that it ain't over until it's over. And then really it's still not over because compost. Things die and become life. So it ain't over till it's over and then it really still is not over because of compost. And brambles and birch trees and all the pioneer plants and mycelii and mushrooms. Thank you. That's me out. Handing back to my brother, my sisters here. Um, it'll be good to publish your four four point plan, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> um, these past three days has been wonderful with our sister celebrating her birthday here. Ruby, happy birthday. Um, and to you both for bringing this community together. Um, thank you. Gratitude to you. And for keeping hope alive, a different texture of hope, mm -hmm. even when it seemed like this is going to be canceled, um, for making it happen. So thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming. Um, love needs heartbreak to be fully itself. Um, let us go to the places of, break, uh, of breaking open and do the work that wants to be done there. Thank you.